So the intention for this week is to offer us opportunities to, to really taste the power of this precious jewel of Sangha. So that we might know that Sangha is more than just uh, an abstract or ideal or some uh, remote idealized cosmology. Like the other two jewels, the Buddha and the Dharma, the Sangha is right here a precious tool for transformation and insight right in front of us. And I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share my passion for framing the spiritual life as always relational. I say that because I see Sangha as an arena in which we test our conceptual understandings of the potential of our life within this crucible of embodied relationship. When combined with meditation, I very much see Sangha as being like a kind-hearted and yet powerful mirror through which we can first notice, then see and begin to transform our limited and our limiting views. Because of this potential, Sangha can become a key medium of revelation, a means through which by being curious about ourselves, curious about each other, and what we describe as the open dimension of being in our lived experience, we can take confident steps towards softening and releasing towards this mystery that is liberation. So although our focus is going to be on Sangha, it's of course uh, can never be separated from the other two jewels. They're an integral and inseparable whole. We only work effectively as a Sangha if we're nourishing its roots in the Buddha Dharma. So for this reason, I'm gonna to start today's talk by looking at a key Dharmic principle, which I'm gonna be drawing on this week. And uh, this principle is given the Sanskrit term of shunyata. So best uh, way of evoking this probably is to recite part of the Heart Sutra, which is the class classic text which points to this uh, uh, Dharmic principle. So in the Heart Sutra we have, form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form. Form is only emptiness, emptiness only form feeling thought and choice consciousness itself are the same as this so this is the mystery the mystery of not to dancing with emptiness and form emptiness and feeling emptiness and choice emptiness and consciousness this is shunyata and the text goes on to say, in a slightly different translation to the one we have in the puja, says, owing to the indifference to any kind of personal attainment and through relying on this perfection of, wis uh, perfection of wisdom, they dwell without thought coverings. And in the absence of thought coverings, they have not been made to tremble. They have overcome what can upset. So this is what fascinates me, is the more that we can listen to our embodied being and release from our thought coverings, the less we can be made to tremble. We'll naturally begin to release from that which can upset. And this is really uh, the setting out of the intention for this week. So reflecting upon the nature of shunyata, really helps us to live in this cremation ground that softens, that burns up or rots down any sense of a fixed or a separate selfhood, which is fabricated out of these five elements that establish our distinct psychophysical organism. So what Shunyata is pointing to is the noble experience that all form feeling, perceptions, volitions, and even consciousness are conditioned. They're fleeting, transitory, and ephemeral. So 
So this is where we're starting from. And I think the first thing I'd like to do uh, during this uh, uh, talk is to celebrate that many of us find ourselves here in this cremation ground of Sangha because something has broken in or broken down that has kind of opened us into this space. Maybe it was through a loss of a job or a relationship or a loved one, maybe an arrival of some illness. These difficult experiences are painful and distressing and difficult, but they are a gift also that carry us deeper into this reality of being human because they make visible the fleeting nature of everything that we thought was permanent and would always be. So through these apparent difficulties, what we're doing is we are re-establishing a living connection to Shunyata. This might not be always uh, how we access it. It's not how I've described Maybe we've just felt that there's something missing. And we're looking for that. We're searching for that, which we kind of taste, we glimpse, but then it slips again through our fingers. Or we might see through what seems to, uh, seen through what seems to bring meaning and stability for many. But for us, uh, they feels in some way empty, incomplete. And other possibilities are, of course, that we might have been called into this deeper life through the natural world by attraction, by acknowledging some half form longing. So all of these different things I want to frame as, as uh, visitations, as invitations to let go. So I hope we won't forget um, that the title of this retreat is Joy in the Cremation Ground. And this points to the discovery that when we are forced to, by life to let go of a fixed sense of ourselves and each other, of our situation, well, we don't just fall into some empty blankness. What happens is joy arises because we see through the very uh, well we discover the very absence of permanence and fixedness that we've been propelled into it makes possible this next unfolding this next opening so shunyata dissolves and then brings forth the new so there's this interweaving flow dependent on the other so there's an abundance always with potential through which with sensitivity, responsiveness and lucid awareness, all these things can begin to, sham, uh, begin to shimmer through our lives. When we not, uh, because when we release, not just from loss, but uh, release from these uh, fixed views, we open ourselves to potential abundance. So this is the joy in the cremation ground. The joy comes when we learn to dance wholeheartedly with whatever appears and between us co-create this mandala of awakening. So within the cremation ground, we are invited to notice how much of the time we are overlaying what the text describes as our thought coverings onto experience. And in doing so, we are obscuring the, uh, the immediacy, the arising, the fading of the wisdom within our somatic cloud of sensations. So the practice of Sangha is to support us to recognize and release from our self-created confusion. We're invited to notice sensation and response, recognizing opening and release, recognize grip and binding. 
So these shifts that are happening all the time in our, in our bodies, in our embodied knowing, these uh, can be large, even overwhelming, or they may well be very small shifts, maybe emerging in the midst of a conversation or a meditation. And we are given these glimpses to point out when we are being caught by these veils or thought coverings, they are the things that are kind of create that grip or where we see through them, where they're broken through by these major life events or gently challenged through communication or study or meditation or simply noticing the world around us. So the gift is that we have the opportunity to see these veils arising like a magician, creating permanence where there is only flow, creating solidity where there's only insubstantiality and conjuring lasting satisfaction and beauty, where there are only fleeting and arising form. And this is why embodiment, embodied knowing is so important because it's through this direct embodied felt experience where we meet ourselves and the world, we begin to recognize this dissonance between our thoughts and our embodied sensate knowing. And this is the key territory of the joyful cremation ground. So the problem is this, uh, this is when our veils of views and desires are activated, we can easily become fixed and rigid because we become identified or bound with a partial view of how things are. What we're doing here is we're trying to protect or hold on to a particular position. And it's sad to say that this happens even in relation to the Dharma. And one of the aims of this retreat is to encourage inquiry into this simple fact of where are we gripping and where are we flowing. Unless we do that, we risk breaching this precious thread that is always weaving and renewing connection and leading us home to love. Back to the Dharma and its expression through Sangha. So this thread that weaves and leads us home to love is Eros. So sensitivity to Eros is one of the key areas that we can really attune so that we can recognize the subtleties of our responses to life. Eros supports us to notice how and when and where we're relaxing and becoming enlivened flowing with joy into this potential of this life, this Sangha, but it also shows us where we are drying up, what is leading us to lose our vitality and our connection. So Eros reminds us that everything we need is right here. We can accomplish our deepest longings by opening to what is right here under our noses. The path of liberation is simply a matter of exploring how we're perceiving experience. It's not about creating a different experience. Everything is here and now, everything is sufficient for us to discover liberation in this moment. So I'm going to spend the remainder of the talk just briefly going through the three aspects of Eros. Uh, these have been, uh, this is a, a way of understanding Eros in, in more detail. So Eros really is the, the life energy. It's this vibrational aliveness that brightens our sensations. We might see it as energy in the breath that brings our body to life. Uh, but it's carried in between in this dance between the in and the out breath. It's the energy that permeates 
and awakens our somatic cloud of sensations that we describe as our body. Eros can seem really elusive because it's always fluid, its manifestations always changing. It can feel beguiling, disturbing. It fascinates and draws us into life, into relationship and out of our preconceptions, our assumptions. So Eros is both messenger and guide. Its absence binds us, kind of blinds us and leads us into a very tight and painful cul-de-sac of our own making. Without this sense of energy of Eros, we will find ourselves becoming dry and brittle, lifeless or withdrawn. Yet when it's present, there's a vividness and a sense of abundance and wholeness. Eros arrives, it, uh, arises amongst and between. It calls us, it bridges, it connects and weaves. And this is why Eros is so closely connected to the manifestations of a healthy Sangha. The Greeks described three aspects to Eros. I'm quickly going to go through them. Uh, they are Himeros, Antiros and Pothos. And I think uh, can be helpful to, uh, to recognize these three aspects. So firstly, Himeros, this is the experience of our physical, our emotional and intellectual responses to that which attracts. It's a sense of being drawn towards, drawn out, attracted through our senses has the nature of curiosity and attraction and it brings a natural clarity and brightness to awareness. So Himeros is this quality of attention that really wants to know and is excited by the fine detail, the qualities, the edges and energy of appearance. It draws us into life. It's naturally curious. It's recognition of the sensuous nature of being human. We are tactile, responsive human beings. So it draws us into the fullness and the subtlety of sensation. And also draws us towards the mystery of what we describe as other. It draws us into the world around us. Himeros is this sense of being nourished as we sit in meditation or sit with each other or wander in an abundant natural world. The more complex aspect of Himeros is that unfortunately it can be disruptive, it can be unasked for. We may see or know more clearly than we can bear and so on occasions, our knowing has to be buried in the darkness of our own bodies, simply for our survival. It may lead us to see through or below the display, some making some aspects of social interaction feel rather empty or inadequate. It has the power to lead us into a new appreciation of life that can challenge that which we've imbibed uh, and these habitual views of the familiar or the familial uh, become uh, empty. Himros disrupts and disturbs these patterns, bringing the moisture that we need for our lives. So this is the first aspect, Himros. The second one, uh, Antiros. So Antiros is described as the reciprocal or the answering call of Eros. And in this aspect, Eros, there's a sense of exchange and meeting. So Antiros is a sense of gratitude by, through being known by another. The deep pleasure of really being seen by being witnessed by another. 
we know ourselves often by being met in the gaze of another. So Antiros may be known through the absence of reciprocation as well, this sense of not being seen and somehow getting lost in some way. So this may be familiar to us when we risk revealing ourselves and we are met simply by trying to someone trying to fix us. How can, uh, well, how painful is that? That somehow we've shown something about ourselves, which then becomes a problem to be solved. In this way, we're not really being met where we are. We're being directed, led into some Im imagined future where we will be, become different. And this lack of anteros can really bring with it a sense of aloneness, even abandonment or shame for who we are, where we are right now. The other risk around anteros is that we might lead us, it might lead us to try to conform and get it right. So because we all long for this sense of anteros, it may lead us to uh, uh, do what we think is expected of us to receive this reciprocating gaze. So I think I'll leave that there, just leave that hanging. But this is why Sangha is so important. Uh, it's such a complex but rich situation because Himeros can only flourish alongside Antiros. So we're always having to negotiate how we express our unique sensibility to allow it to flourish and mature and be witnessed without judgment or needing it to be undone in some way. So Antiros, this need to be known and reflected by others is crucial. And it's through that mirroring that we come to know ourselves more clearly. And conformity is really the death knell of Sangha. When we seek affirmation and security by masking or losing touch with parts of ourselves to fit into any perceived norms, Well, we, uh, this potential of Sangha is reduced to ashes. So Antiros really requires that we develop this capacity to meet and celebrate our differences, our diversity, without needing to fix our stumbling and fumbling, just as they are, these attempts to embody our potential in the clear light of sensitive awareness. So I'm aware of the time. We're just going to quickly talk about the last aspect, which is pothos. So pothos is this aspect of eros, when we sense we are being called by something which is always just beyond or behind the immediate experience. It's the itch, the yearning, the longing and discomfort that moves us to act. So pothos doesn't have a known object in the way that uh, in the sense of himros and anteros does. It's a mere, uh, more a feeling that we're being called out of ourselves, called by some force or presence beyond uh, our current field of experience. So this could be uh, experienced through the arch archetypal forces contained in the symbols of Buddhism. We may be drawn to some historical figure, some uh, that inspires and guides us. Or we might just feel it in that urge to travel, to explore the world, to find new experiences. It's our quest for meaning and value that, some, that appears out there somewhere which we are trying to uh, 
move towards. And it's probably primarily pothos which carries us into the cremation ground. So pothos is connected to the imaginal, the image, the story and the symbol. And it's also that which is unformed on the edge, the words on those edges of the tongue, the thought that won't quite coalesce into a word, some glimpse, but also confusion, the shadows and the darkness within meditation or in our daily life. It's pothos that calls and yet it's so hard to attend to. So pothos is often only recognized in retrospect. The patterns and the choices and the decisions that led us to a, to, uh, to a particular place, a particular way of living our life. We only re really recognize pothos as we look back. But the more we're able to listen and to notice what calls us, the more we give ourselves over to this deeper significance of our life. To trust pothos is to the enter into the mystery, to enter into the service of imminent potential, which is always there in Shunyata. That which we can never hope to know, but only serve. So it's these three aspects that enliven the Sangha. And my hope is that by honoring Eros, we serve that which is always seeking embodiment and manifestation. This glorious display of unconditional love, inseparable from the simple and profound experience of trusting the value of simply cultivating and resting in awareness. So this is as far as we're going to go this morning. Um, going to leave it there and we'll carry on tomorrow uh, in more detail, opening up this area more fully. But for today, we'll leave it there. And uh, we'll have a very short break uh, before...